He is risen. He is risen indeed. Ah, I don't want to hear a little bit better. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. This is the day we celebrate that. And all around the world, different churches and different places have a tradition around that. Usually it's built around a greeting. And, you know, it's he is risen and the other person says he is risen indeed. And that's, of course, what the tradition is here. If I were to go to my wife's church on the other side of the world and experience her congregation and I went up to shake someone's hand, they don't even say hello. What they say? Christos vos What? And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, of course, the answer is, or the result is, Vaistini vos kres. Vaistini. Vaistini means truly, truly. We say indeed. But the idea is truly. Truly, he's, in, he's been risen. And Vaskres is risen, of course, in Russian, in the Russian days of the week. What they name Sunday? Voskresenia, resurrection. Amen. Resurrection, the name of the day. The name of the day. You know, it's, it's interesting to me that all around the world, of course, you have people who say, well, yeah, that's a nice story, or no, we don't believe any of it, it's all a fabrication. Uh, you've got all that, but I would venture, I guess, beyond that, that there are many places where people are going to a church and they're participating in that in a, as a tradition, and they're saying back and forth, he is risen, he is risen indeed, or, uh, you know, truly he's risen, and they're saying those things to each other, and yet if you were to go up and ask them, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross as a payment for sin, that he was buried for three days and he was physically resurrected on the third day, which gave him not only authority uh, over death, but authority to give life. I would venture guess you'd get a lot of people going, what? What? You know, <laughs> thinking about that, my desire for you this morning is to talk to you about how you know this is true. How do we know it's true? And I'd like to give you some ammunition so that you can know and have a good piece, some good pieces of evidence so that you can know that this is all true. Beyond that, I want to ask a second question. Number one, how can we know it's true? But number two is, how's it relevant? What do, what do I do with this? What difference does it make to me today? You know, even whether I believe it or not, does it make a difference in my life today, right now, and in the coming weeks? I'd like to answer both of those questions, but let me attack the first one first. How can we know it's true? Well, court of law, you know, you have the jury, and what are the jury here? The jury hears witnesses. And usually it's not just one, because if it's one, that's not enough. And yet, if you think about it, many of the religions in the world are dependent upon a single testimony. Um, not the case with Christianity. With Christianity, you have a history of, men, of several millennia where you have voices that claim to speak from God. And guess what? They all gave testimony to what he told them to say. And those things, if they are to be believed, must be credible and must be consistent in order to be the truth because at the end of the day the jury will say okay we heard from five witnesses did they all basically say the same thing did we hear the same story were they consistent and if they were then the jury can pretty much go yep guilty or yep innocent right well let's apply that to scripture because we know the story of the death burial and resurrection but what other pieces of evidence would point us to that and point to the truthfulness and accuracy of that? Well, a couple of things. Number one is if you move backwards from the New Testament back into the Old Testament, of course there were many of the Old Testament prophets who gave bits and pieces of what would happen in the life of Jesus. And, and where he would be born, and how he would be born, and what he would do, and what he would accomplish. So we see those throughout the prophets. But when you come to the book of Isaiah, and you know that Isaiah prophesied, Isaiah 53, 700 years or more 
before Jesus came. 700 years or more before Jesus came. And if you've ever read Isaiah 53, get ready. Or if you've never read it, get ready, because I'm going to read a little bit of it. I just want you to hear something that was written more than 700 years before Jesus. This is Isaiah 53, starting with verse 4, if you have your Bibles and care to follow along. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Sound familiar? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Here's something written more than 700 years before Jesus came, and we're already talking about his sacrifice for sin and his burial. But it gets better. Take a look. Verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. All right, so again, a sacrifice for sin. And then look at verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Death, burial, resurrection. Who could he be? <laughs> 700 years. And you say, okay, well, yeah, that's good. That's pretty specific. It's pretty specific. Spells it out pretty much like that could only be Jesus. And it only really fits the pattern that we know. But is there more? Yes, there's more. <laughs> All right. We've already gone 700 years. Let's go back another 800. Let's go to 1,500 years or more before Jesus came. There was an event that took place involving national Israel. They were prisoners. They were slaves in Egypt. And what we celebrate, what the Jews celebrate this weekend is something called Passover. And of course, the idea comes from their exodus and when they left Egypt because of the plagues that God brought upon Egypt uh, and they were finally allowed to go. But they were primarily allowed to go because of that last plague, that last plague that led to this feast and this celebration of Passover that the Jews still celebrate. What I'd like to do today is look at it and then talk about the relevance, okay? But in the first place, I would like to give it as a piece of evidence to say like, no, everything was pointing the same direction. All the witnesses are saying the same thing. There is a reason for you to know that it is the truth, and it's because all the witnesses agree. Not just 700 years before, but 1,500 years before, God was trying to tell you, I've made a way. I've made a way for you to escape. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 5, 7, in case there's a question about the connection. 1 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 7, at the end of that verse, Paul says, For indeed Christ... Our pa Passover, or Passover lamb, was sacrificed for us. Was sacrificed for us. All right? So you say, okay, well, I get it. There's a connection between Passover and a Passover lamb and Jesus. So he's comparing those two. So what, how would we line those up? Let's start. 
In the book of Exodus, chapter 12, we have the original story of what led to the Passover celebration, and it's the original passing over. And again, this is at the end of a bunch of plagues that God has brought upon Egypt, and the Pharaoh's like, nope, 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 I don't care what you do, nope, 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 nope. And so God speaks with Moses, and here's what he tells him. Look at verses 3 through 5. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a, a lamb. According to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. In other words, there needs to be enough of the lamb to cover everybody. Sound familiar? Verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish. Without blemish, a male of the first year, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. So again, without blemish, perfect, perfect, ready to be sacrificed. Verses 6 through 8. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then take a look at this. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it kill it. What'd they do to Jesus? Yeah. The whole congregation of Israel will kill it. All right. So, they shall take the blood, some of the blood, and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Okay, so again, this covering of blood on the doorposts, right? And uh, then they shall... Uh, they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Now that's all connected to Israel's departure from Egypt, of course. The whole fire in terms of the, you know, the, um, the judgment that was coming and the fact that they were going to escape judgment, that's part of it. But you know that fire is not only about judgment, it's also about purification. So that would also be their separation and purification from the evils and the, all the injustice and the slavery of the Egyptians. So you have that from the Jewish side, but from a believer's side, what does this say to us? You know, roasted in fire, roasted in fire. Jesus was pure. He was the lamb without blemish. God was judging him because he carried our sin. Beyond that, it says with unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. Leaven is always bad all throughout Scripture. And from the Jewish perspective, it was like we're leaving Egypt. And if you read the full story, part of the story is that they left so fast that the women didn't have time to take the leaven along. But from a spiritual perspective, the idea of leaven is always bad or false beliefs and bad or false activity or actions. In other words, sin. So you've got all of that that, that here we have signifies like, no, this is part of the equation with this lamb and with the, the, the blood of this lamb is that you're going to participate in it with unleavened bread, pure, no leaven, no leaven. All right, bitter herbs, bitter herbs from the Jewish perspective, they were bitter because, you know, it's, they were, had been in slavery for 400 years, you know, it's like, what do we do to got, got to get out of this? Because this is, you know, just horrible. This is a horrible thing. But from a spiritual perspective, you have Jesus who suffered and died. So, do not eat it raw. This is verse 9. Do not eat it raw, nor boil it all with water, but roast it in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning. And what remains, if there is anything of it until morning, you'll burn with fire. Why is that important? Why would they go to the trouble to spell that out? God's spelling this out to Moses in terms of the way that they're supposed to practice this. And again, my argument is that this lines up with Jesus. He said, it's got to all be gone. 
In other words, this lamb needs to be 100% sacrifice. What do we know of Jesus? How much did he give? 100%. Complete sacrifice. All right. Verse 11. Thus you shall eat it. <laughs> Thus you shall eat it with, <laughs> with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste, because it is the Lord's Passover. So while they're doing this, while they're eating this lamb and they've got the blood on the door, they're doing that in preparation for their escape because of what God is about to do. What God is about to do. All right? And you remember, they've seen the other plagues come and go. They've seen Pharaoh go, uh-uh. I ain't letting you out. You're, you're still my slaves. I'm not letting you go. But what does he go on to tell Moses? Verses 12 and 13. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment because I am the Lord. All right? So he's going to pass through the land of Egypt, right? And he's going to strike all the firstborn. What happened at Jesus' birth? Everybody remember that? Just the opposite, wasn't it? If all the other firstborn got killed, and he's the only one that survived it. So, verse 13, Now the blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you are, and here's what you underline. Here's what I want you to underline, right here. Blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. When we get to relevance, I think you're going to see this is the critical piece right there. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now Moses hears all that from God, and then God tells, tells him, like, okay, go tell him, go tell him. And if we jump down to verse 21, what we see is Moses calling the people, and I just want you to hear that he repeats that very piece, and it's going to be important to us a little further on. Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourselves according to your families, and kill the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts uh, with the blood that is in the basin. In the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. Why? Because that blood was the protection. That blood signified their deliverance. That blood signified their forthcoming freedom and flight from slavery. And verse 23, the key. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians... And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. Now, the des destroyer was actually a messenger, an angel uh, of God, who not only did bad things but good things. But when we did some bad things like this, that's pretty bad. But it's the judgment of God, right? And so what he says is that this destroyer is not going to come into your house to hurt you if, you if I see the blood on your door. What I want to do today is create some scenarios for you based on what is often taught and said in various churches around the world that sort of takes away from this story and the truth of this story and the consistency of this story leading up to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What I'm gonna, how I'm going to do it is I'm going to insert what they would teach into the story. And I invite you to listen, from the, for those of you who come from various church backgrounds and have been taught a certain way over time, and maybe even certain kinds of Baptist churches, um, you know, in terms of what you've heard. I just want to you to hear as I sort of insert some ideas that are very commonly taught into this story, just see what you think. All right? Number one, 
Destroyer is there, and he's, he's in Egypt, and he's looking over the houses, and he sees one that doesn't have any blood on the door. So he goes down into the house, and he walks up to the head of the household, and he says, where's the blood? Uh, the guy says, I'm not ready. I'm not, what do you mean you're not ready? No, I'm not ready. I need to straighten up my house first. Um, you, you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't remember if I made the bed, but I, I know I still have to do the dishes, and um, I, I'm thinking maybe the floor's not swept, and there, there may be a couple of things out of order. So before I can put the blood on the door, I know I need to straighten all that out. That work for anybody? Is it what you see in the story? To which the destroyer would say, well, you know what? It's not about that. It's about the blood. That's all it's about. It's about the blood and whether you have it on your door or not. Give me your kid. Number two. Destroyer is there and he's looking for the, the blood. And he comes down and he sees the blood on the door, but he goes in anyway. And he walks up to the head of the household and he says, yeah, see, you got the blood on your door. And the guy says, yeah, yeah, I, I did just what you said. He goes, well, that's a good start. The destroyer says, that's a good start. And the person says, well, a good start? What do you mean? Well, he said, they must have told you that it's not just that, that there's more to it than that. Like, you know, you not only have to put the blood on your door, but you have to be so committed that you, you basically need to give me your stuff. So, you know, I kind of kind of like that chair over there. Um, and do you have any gold or silver stuff? I'm, I'm going to need you to bring that because, you know, unless you're willing to give me all that and give me the rest of your stuff, then that blood's not really effective. Anybody see that? In the text? No, I didn't think so. And yet that is a very common teaching from many, many places. And I'm sure some of you recognize it. Here's another fun one. The destroyer's flying over Egypt and he looks down and he sees a door without any blood. So he walks into the door and he says, you know, how come you don't have any blood on your door? And he says, Ugh. the guy says, I don't need it. What do I need that for? <laughs> Look at this house. Look at the workmanship on this tile that I laid. And psh, these cabinets, I'm telling you, after I did this upgrade, aren't they impressive? Aren't they impressive? And not only that, I make my bed every morning first thing when I get up, and I'm faithful about the dishes, and I do all of that stuff. And, you know, why would I, what would I need the blood for? Why would I need that? And, you know, if you really want to talk to somebody who needs the blood on their door, <laughs> I got a lot more going on than my neighbors do. So why don't you go talk to them? Because, you know, looking at them and comparing what I'm doing to what they're doing, well, they, they probably need the blood, but I'm good. To which the destroyer would say, where's your son? Where's your kid? Yeah. All right, and here's one of my favorites. <laughs> the... Uh, destroyer is flying over Egypt and he looks down and he sees the door and he sees the blood on the door and he walks in anyway and he speaks to the head of the household and he says so you think you got blood on your door and the guy says oh yeah he said well you probably shouldn't be so sure about that you probably should just wait before you you know be that dogmatic about knowing whether or not you had the blood on the door because it might not really be that. And you, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? I remember putting the blood on the door. I remember doing that. So no, 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 no. But it might not be real blood. And you might not be one of the ones that God chose to give the real blood. And so the only way we're going to figure that out is if you keep your house clean and do everything properly within your house over the period of the rest of your life. And then we'll figure out whether or not maybe you have the real blood or not. Does that work for anybody? Anybody see any of that in the text? And yet that is a very popular teaching today from many pulpits. I'm here to tell you. Shh. And the last one. The destroyer comes over and he's looking around and he 
sees the blood on the door, but he goes in anyway. And he speaks to the person, uh, the head of the household. He says, like, look, I, I see the blood on the door, but you do know the game now, right? And the person says, what do you mean? I, I did what you told me to do. Yeah, yeah, but you need to keep it fresh. And well, how do I keep it fresh? Well, you keep your house in order and you make sure that the dishes are done and the bed is made and the, you know, the wife is happy and the kids are well behaved. And as you do that, that'll freshen up that blood. And if you're not doing that, then what happens is the paint kind of dries up and flakes off. And if I come back later on and I see that the blood is sort of dried up and flaked off, well, then I'm going to have to get your kid. Is it there? It's not there, is it? That's not what we see, is it? And yet that's another very popular teaching from many pulpits. And what I would tell you this morning is, not only is this a consistent testimony with Isaiah 53 and with the entire New Testament narrative concerning Jesus, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, but it is a consistent testimony to the work of God so that we didn't, have to, we didn't have to do anything. We simply relied on the blood. If you think about the Jews in Egypt, they've watched all these plagues, and what have they been able to do to get Pharaoh to change his mind? To get Pharaoh to let them go, what, what could they do? Nothing. Nothing. They have to have known that by that point. It's like, no, it's, it's got to be a God thing. God is going to have to be the one to deliver us. Right. Independent of anything that we do or say or think, God has to do it. That is called grace. Amen. That's called grace. And if you think about Jesus, what did he do? He bled on the pieces of wood that made up the cross, horizontal and vertical. All right. So that's grace. That's grace. That's unmerited favor. So it's unmerited because you didn't do anything for it. You couldn't do anything for it. What could you have done to stop the destroyer from taking your firstborn? What could you have done? There was only one thing you could do. Cover it with the blood. All right, so I'm going to end today with a couple of questions. Number one, is there blood on your doorpost? You may be here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for your sins and to set you free. And what this story tells us, and Isaiah 53 tells us, and the New Testament tells us, is that that's part of what Jesus died for so that he could free you and all it requires is you saying, yes, I want that blood to cover me. I want that blood to be on my doorpost. And you can know that. You can know that. And I invite you today, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, to simply in your head just say, Lord, I trust you. I trust you to be the blood on my doorpost, to be my Savior, to give me freedom so that I can escape death. I can escape judgment. I can escape the curse just by trusting you. The other thing I would tell you is starting with the Passover and moving into Isaiah 53 and moving into the New Testament. One of the things that you not only see that those testimonies are consistent, but they all bear witness to something else, and that is the love of God. God wants you to know, and he's wanted you to know from the very beginning that he loves his creation. He wants a relationship with his creation, and he's done everything necessary to restore the relationship with his creation. And all he's asking you to do is hear him because he wants that with you because he loves you. You know... God is an infinite source of love and acceptance. We as people in the world, we look to finite sources. And so many of us, if we look around us, we say, oh, who, who do you depend on for your sense of love and acceptance? It would be a, a spouse, right? Or a child or a parent or a you know, friend or whatever. And invariably, what happens with that? 
because they're finite resources, they let us down. And yet here is God saying, I love you, I favor you, I want the best for you, and in him we have an infinite resource. The only question becomes, will you experience that? Because it's true, and that testimony is true, but will you experience it? Because that's what he wants for you. It's what he wants for you. And finally, this morning, I'd like to say, are you moving away? If you know you've covered your doorposts. You know the blood has covered you. You know you're, you've been declared righteous. You know you you're left Egypt, all of that kind of stuff. But are you moving away from the voices that were in Egypt? Are you moving away? Because we go through our week, and how many voices are there around us? And what percentage of those do you think are God? So we walk through the week, we turn on the TV, we hear other people talking, and they give us all those ideas, and they're all around us. And are they from Egypt, or are they from God? It's because if you're going to hear the voice, the only voice that is the truth, you've got to be able to leave the voices away, get the voices away that would pollute his voice, that would bring leaven into the unleavened bread. If we can go back to uh, 1 Corinthians 5, let me just show you the bigger context of this verse where Paul says Christ is our Passover. Take a look. Verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 5. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? In other words, if you're unleavened, if you've been set free, if you've been protected, if you've been covered, <laughs> you know, and, and God has said, yes, you're worthy of rescue, and I'm rescuing you, and you're free now. You don't have to have anything to do with Egypt. Do you not realize that there's still that leaven that's hanging around? Do you not realize that I want you to get rid of that? Verse 7, therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, for you truly are. You tr hear that word, truly? Truly? He is risen indeed. He's risen truly in Russian. He says, you truly are unleavened. If the, paint, if the blood is on your doorposts, you are unleavened, according to Paul. But that doesn't mean that there aren't voices that are pulling that leaven back in. But, you know, what do I do? Purge out the old leaven. The Corinthians were a mess. Were a mess. And what does Paul say about them? You truly are unleavened. So my question to you today, believer, if you're here, you know you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you know your sins are forgiven, you know you have eternal life, what voices are you hearing? What voices are you choosing to listen to? And are you willing to take the time to commit to saying, God, I want to hear your voice? Because one of the things that happens around that, one of the things that happens with me, is I say, one of the ways I hear your voice is through other believers who are listening to your voice. And many, many conversations I've had in this church with fellow believers, I'll have a conversation with them, and they'll say something to me, and I'm I just heard God's voice. That doesn't happen in isolation. That doesn't happen in isolation. I invite you to be part of a body and be committed to a body where you have the opportunity and the possibility of hearing the voice of the creator of the universe because he wants you to know that you are loved. He wants you to know that you are favored, that he wants to bless you. It's up to you. It's up to you. If you're a believer, you left Egypt. You left Egypt. So what are you doing about the leaven? Let's pray. 
Thank you for joining Zebulon's Dynamic Downtown Fellowship at Zebulon First Baptist Church. We're located on the square in Zebulon, Georgia, next to City Pharmacy. If you've not visited with us in person, we invite you to do so. Our early service is at 8.30 a.m., Bible study for all ages at 9.45, and our late service is at 11 o'clock a.m. We would be honored to have you visit our church. We have a safe and growing children's ministry and an energetic youth ministry. If you'd like someone to pray with you or if you have questions, you can call the church office at 770-567-8498. Our email address is firstzeb at bellsouth.net, or you can simply send us a private message through Facebook. Please be sure to join us next Sunday at 11 a.m. right here for our live stream.